series on Elisha the Tishbite. So we're going to start that this morning. Elijah is a very important character in the Bible. We see a whole lot about him, and it's just a great story, great character. So I want to take a close look at that. Today we're going to be talking about the faith of Elijah. All right, but let me talk about how important of a character he is throughout the Bible. First of all, he's an example of faith and prayer in the Bible. Look at James chapter 5. A great example of faith and prayer. James chapter 5, look at starting in verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and your is against you and, uh, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold, the hire of your laborers uh, who have reaped down your, uh, your fields is kept, uh, is kept back... Uh, Man, I'm sorry. I don't need to start that far back. Let's let's skip ahead a little bit. Go to uh, go to verse twelve. But above all things, my brother, swear not neither uh, by heaven, neither by earth, neither by in any oath. But let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into conversation. This is the part I was looking for. I'm sorry. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pr- pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now it's going to give an example of a righteous man. And the fervent prayer of a righteous man, Elias, which uh, that's the, what we see in the New Testament for Elijah. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. That's good to know. As we study the life of Elijah, we're going to see that he's a man just like we are. He's not like some, uh, uh, you know, when you read the story of Elijah, he pops on the scene out of nowhere. And you might almost start thinking like a Melchizedek kind of idea, like, is this like some kind of supernatural? No, he's a man just like just like you are, just like we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months. I don't know if you ever prayed that it wouldn't rain <laughs> for a certain event. Uh, my uh, my kids and went out to a wedding the other day, and it, they said it's thunderstormed at that person's wedding. And I thought, oh man, that's a terrible situation. Unless they got like a free dress or something out of it. You know, sometimes if they if it rains on your wedding day, they give you a free dress anyway. <laughs> but I'm like, can you imagine the amount of prayer that probably went into that? Please, God, stop the rain for this uh, for for this wedding, right? Well, Elias was a man who was he had the faith. To just go before God and say, you know, I'm going to, or go before Ahab at least to say, I'm going to pray to God that it's not going to rain until I give the command and it rains again. And that happened for uh, for three years or six months, it says. Now, also look at uh, Malachi. Come back to the Old Testament right before you get to Matthew. Uh, we got Malachi. Not only is Elijah an, a great example of faith and prayer in the Bible, But we see that John the Baptist was compared to him and and his his the spirit of Elijah. So Malachi chapter four, look at verse five. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite and, the, uh, and smite the earth with a curse. Now compare that to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, start with verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, talking about John the Baptist, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say, 
to, un, unto you and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I, sh I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And so he's talking about John the Baptist. He goes on here to say that he's, you know, of women, there's not, uh, born of women, there's not uh, risen a greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus is speaking very highly of him and says, hey, he was prophesied that he would come. Now, all the prophecies in the Old Testament that somebody's going to come was talking about Jesus. That was a very important thing. But here in this case, even John the Baptist was prophesied uh, that he would come, but it calls him Elijah, which is pretty interesting. Matthew 17, just, just a couple more here. Then we'll get started in the message. Matthew chapter 17. We see also uh, an interesting situation where in the transfiguration, Elijah is kind of comes back on the scene with Jesus. Matthew 17. Uh, let me see here. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, uh, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. And so this is an interesting situation. Not preaching the text right now, but, uh, but he sees this transfiguration. Elijah and Moses are on the scene. Now, largely because of this verse and uh, a couple of things that we're about to see in Revelation, I believe Elijah is one of the two witnesses. Uh, so let's look at Revelation real quick. The two witnesses, what do I mean? In the last days, in the, uh, the right before the tribulation, or actually, I'm sorry, after the tribulation, there will be these two witnesses that will be preaching the gospel, and those who are re remaining on earth will... Uh, will hate these guys. There are men of God, prophets, uh, also witnesses, and they'll be preaching the gospel and they'll be even put to death and then God will raise them up again. Revelation 11 talks about that. Revelation 11 verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Doesn't that sound like Elijah? So it's mentioning back to this time where he shut, he uh, was able to pray and he shut up, uh, uh, the heavens were shut up. And, uh, and it says then, and have power over water to turn it into blood. That sounds like Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. It sounds like these two characters are somehow uh, raised up. My sus suspicion is that they're raised up at the same time at the uh, at resurrection. You know, you got the uh, 144,000 will be left and the two witnesses will be left. That's my sus suspicion, suspicion. And then the rest of us will go up to be with the Lord. All right. But whatever the case, Elijah and uh, Moses will be here. So, so we see a very important you know, all throughout the Bible, Elijah plays a very important role. And so I've always just also liked the story. I remember one of the first messages I preached, uh, like actually like a, a, a pastor had me preach at their church. Okay, it was my dad, but still. <laughs> I preached on a double portion. And I remember really studying the life of Elijah and then the life of Elisha and just study the whole thing real deeply. I probably preached like over an hour or something like that because I had way too much information. But I remember one of my first messages was on Eli Elijah, and I thought that character ever since has just been super important, very exciting to read the story. So hopefully this will be a neat little uh, uh, series as we look at the life of Elijah the Tishbite. All right, but today what I mainly want to just dwell on in, in this first part of, of uh, 1 Kings 17 is where it talks about uh, it just introduces the character, and we see that he was a man of faith. So go back to First Kings, if you're already there. All right, First Kings 17. All right, so number one, just a simple, obvious point here. Elijah had faith in God. Elijah had faith in God. Now, First of all, we see that actually this faith, I believe, is something that he had from a very young age. 
I think he was born into a family of faith, and that becomes very obvious. Other than that, we know nothing about his background. It says Elijah the Tishbite. Nobody really knows what a Tishbite is or what that place is that they're talking about. There's been some speculations. I think some, some other uh, historians like Josephus have some ideas about that, but we really don't know. We want to know what the Bible says, and it says nothing about Tishbites. It does talk a little bit about Gilead, and it says that he was of the inhabitants, uh, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. And he went up to Ahab, right? He said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, behold, I mean, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And then we're going to see in the Bible where it just constantly coming to Elijah, the word of the Lord said unto Elijah. All right, so he was a man of faith. But what I want you to notice about this idea of he, him being born into that, mainly I'm thinking about just the area that he is and his stand for the Lord and the fact that he is in Gilead. And then I want you to notice his name, Elijah. Right now, you can look up names, and uh, there's different sources, and they'll tell you what the name means, but a lot of times you just, you're just taking some man's word for it, some man's word for it. But if you look at the two parts of his name, Eli, right? El is another thing. We, we see that a lot in the Bible. My first thought, it's Aramaic, but my first thought was Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, whenever Jesus is, is saying, my father, uh, father, father, why have thou uh, forsaken me? And that word is used, father, father, Eli. Well, we also know the Bible, El, you know, Elohim. So you see El, and then you see also another part, Jah, right? And every time we see Jah in the Bible or Jehovah, we know those are all talking about uh, the Lord. So uh, many have said that the name Elijah means uh, my, uh, my Lord is Jehovah. Okay, my Lord is Jehovah. And that makes sense whenever you look at that, that name. And uh, if you look at chapter 17, verse 12, I'll give you another example. It seems as though people who knew Elijah, whether or not they were making reference to his name or not, when they knew Elijah, they knew one thing about Elijah. This was a man of God. And so in verse 12, it says, and he said, as the Lord thy God liveth. All right. This is the lady that we'll talk about here in a minute, the widow. She says, as the Lord thy God liveth. You know, uh, this is the idea that he, you know, the Lord is his God. Jehovah is his God. No, anytime that it says capital L, capital O, R, D, uh, though, that's talking about Jehovah. <clears throat> All right. And then chapter 18, verse 10, we see it again. Chapter 18, verse 10. This is whenever he comes uh, to Obadiah, and it says, As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whither my Lord hath not seen uh, sent to seek thee. So anyway, he's just talking to Elijah, and he says, As the Lord thy God liveth. What, wouldn't it be nice to just like everywhere you go, when they talk about the Lord, they say, you know, the Lord God of Pastor Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord God of David Stevie or whatever. That would be quite an honor, wouldn't it? Because they see you and they recognize. And one of the great, one of the the, the worst things that you can happen in your life is that somebody will look at you, they talk about you, and not even know you're a Christian. And it's something that I've seen at times in my life where uh, you know, maybe I talked to somebody I went to high school with, and they'll find out that I'm a pastor now or something. They'll say, Hey, I didn't when we were in high school, I didn't know you were a Christian. Oh, man, that's like a knife <laughs> in my heart, you know, because you want the world to know that you're a Christian. You, your life should, you should be like a light to the world, right? Let them see your good works so they may glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, they should see you as a Christian and say, oh, man, the God of, you know, and then state your name. Uh, so this was the case with Elijah. He was born into it, had a name uh, that, was, that said, the Lord is Jehovah. He was known for following the Lord. And, uh, and I think that we can just assume that his faith came from his, you know, his family. Now, here's a problem with when your faith comes from your family. I don't know, you've probably thought about this, and I've heard a lot of people ask me this. What if somebody was born, you know, into a Muslim country or something like that? Now, Muslims are very, very, uh, they tie in their religion to their birth, right? To where, to their, their culture and everything. And so you knock on a door, you come across a Muslim, they're going to say, oh, I'm Muslim. 
You know what I mean? That's just like that is defines who they are because they're born into it or whatever. And you're like, well, you can think for yourself, but no, they're born into it. Now, Christians are so, somewhat like that as well. We should be. We should say, hey, you know, I was raised a Christian. Uh, I remember one time talking to this guy and I said, oh, do you have a church back? What's your church background? Do you, uh, you know, you were raised in church or whatever? And he said, well, I'm like a 16th part Methodist and a 16th part Lutheran. And a, <laughs> and he wasn't joking. He was like saying like, well, well, my mom was this, but my grandpa was that. And he's like figuring out and saying like, he just naturally just, <laughs> you know, well, he was born into this family. So he's, he's part Lutheran and part, uh, you guys don't think that's funny. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are not born into our faith that way. Right. But here is what is is really awesome is if you live a christian life and you are honestly living that living out your faith and your children under your house uh, in your home they watch you and you're reading the bible to them and they're growing up with the terminology and the, then of then it just stands to reason that they're going to grow up and say oh yeah i'm a christian now, we understand that they can't go to heaven based on the fact that their parents were Christians. They have got to have that faith in their own heart, and they've got to put their trust in Jesus Christ like the rest of us. But it should be pretty easy for them to do because they're introduced at a young age to the Bible and to Christ and the Holy Spirit working in them. It's kind of like the uh, Philippian jailer, you know, whenever uh, Paul and Silas said, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. It wasn't like, hey, if you get saved then your, house, your household just automatically, by default, is saved with you. But it's saying, hey, you'll be saved, and, and your house will get saved too as they hear the gospel and they put their faith in it as well. So it goes, later on it shows them preaching to them, and then they end up professing Christ and then following in baptism. And so I think it's, uh, it's pretty good to think about that as parents, uh, particularly your children have got to see your faith. And, uh, and they might become, uh, you know, now I'll say this, if you grew up in a Christian home, some of us did, some of us didn't, uh, I think to whom much is given, much shall be required. And I grew up at a very young age, learning the Bible, parents, you know, making me go to church and, and teaching me these things. I've been under a lot of preaching. I've seen a lot of, uh, of ministry, been involved in a lot of ministry. And so I feel like much is required because of that. If you grew up in a Christian home, you know, you ought to be carrying the torch, so to speak, and you ought to be carrying that light and, and just picking up where your parents left off. You know what I mean? Now, if you got saved later on, or maybe you're a first generation Christian or something like that, it's going to be harder for you. And you might have a lot of baggage in your past. You might have a lot of things that are harder to let go. And, and it's not that God doesn't expect a lot out of you as well. But I'm going to tell you this, it seems to me like God expects those people who know better and were raised that way and don't have all the baggage in the past, uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, to be ambassadors for the Lord. And I, you know, think about the story of the prodigal son. You know, you got the prodigal son uh, and he, he wanders off. But then that, you know, the, the older son is like, you know, well, I don't understand why, you know, why you're you're blessing him because he, he, uh, you know, he went off and he, and he embarrassed you and all that stuff. Paraphrasing, of course. And he says, uh, and, and so the older son, instead of just living for his father and serving him and being faithful and, and enjoying the household and all the luxuries that comes with him being in that household, he's just looking like, why, do I, why does he get that? He doesn't deserve that. You know, or the guys, the laborers out in the field and, and, uh, and every hour, like new people are added to, the labor force. And at the end of the day, they all get paid the same wage. And some of them are like, Hey, that's not fair. We've been working longer than those guys. But the point is made over and over in the Bible that, you know, if you just obey God, wherever you are, you know, if you've been raised in that, you just stick with it and don't worry about, um, you know, your, uh, here's, uh, here's a temptation. That's, that's real. A lot of preachers, like in my situation where you grew up at a young age, uh, you never really got involved in some major sins and wickedness and a, a bad lifestyle and everything thing like that. Once you get out and you start preaching, you start talking to people, sometimes it gets easy to almost feel like, man, I wish I had some kind of testimony of giving up some big sins or having a background because I feel like I can't, you know, nobody's impressed by the fact that I've just always been, like I've just been a Christian since a very young age. 
But here's the fact, you're not, here's the point, you're not trying to impress people. <laughs> you're trying to impress the Lord, right? You're trying to be faithful to the Lord and do what He's called you to do. So you don't need like some great story. You don't need some kind of like huge uh, uh, turning over of your life, you know what I mean? And, 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 and all you need to do is continue and be faithful in that which you were given as a child, okay? Elijah, I believe, was a character like that. Here's one thing we see. Elijah, number two here, Elijah acted on his faith. So not only was he a man of faith, he was, a, he was we would say, a Christian, we would say, saved, saved person. Uh, he, was, he, he acted on his faith. Now, if you think about that, that kind of goes together. That should go without saying. You say, oh, so-and-so is a man of faith. Well, what makes you say that? You're probably going to be implying that this is a person who really lives for the Lord. He really produces, you know, some things, and his life shows the power of the Lord. He obeys God, all these kinds of things. Now, I'm not saying that those works have anything to do with his salvation. I'm just saying that, the, that if he is a man of faith, we would recognize that humanly by the works that he does. Okay, I preached this morning in Iola. Uh, we're going through Hebrews, and we're in Hebrews chapter 9, and, uh, and I preached on, because it talks about uh, turning from dead works, okay? And oftentimes the Bible speaks about turning from dead works. And uh, it seems almost like the Bible contradicts itself because in Romans it says that Abraham was justified by faith. And then when you get to James, it says Abraham was justified by works. And if you're not careful, you'll say, oh, that's a contradiction in the Bible. Okay, but the fact is God sees the heart. All right, he's not impressed by your actions. He's not impressed by your works or anything that you do if it's not done in faith. If it's not done in faith, he knows that. And so I made this, this, uh, this statement. I said, all right, the Bible says in James, and let's go ahead and turn to James chapter 2. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. All right? And here's what I would say. In man's eyes, because we can't see the heart, all we can see is what a person does, then we would say, look, if you told us you had faith, that doesn't mean anything to us. You know, if you said... Hey, you know what? I can help you with this. Brother uh, Josh uh, Jones and, and Iola was talking about how he had gone into this uh, shop and he was trying to buy uh, uh, some computer products or something and elect electrical products. And he asked the guy if he had a certain uh, a certain thing. I don't remember what it was he was looking for. He asked him if he had something, and the guy's like, "Oh yeah, I have one of those." And then he began to talking about it and see how much it cost and everything. And the guy's like, "Oh no, I don't. I, I can't sell you one of those." Uh, he was just saying that he has one of those. I don't know why this popped in my head. But the point was, the guy said he had it. But that doesn't do Josh any good unless the guy said, oh, yeah, I'll sell you one. Here, I'll give you one. Hey, I know where you can find one. All he said is he had it. And then he said, oh, no, I, I don't have anything to sell, to sell you. If somebody tells you that they can help you out and then they don't help you out, what good was it that they said they could help you out? Do you understand where I'm going? Hebrew, uh, James chapter 2. I thought I was there. James chapter 2, let's start with uh, verse 14. What, prof, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother is, or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man uh, may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you the, my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O, o vain man, that faith without works is dead? And so I was talking this morning about that fact that faith without works is dead, but in God's eyes, works without faith is dead, All right? If I see your, from a human, I can't see your heart. And so if you tell me something, but you don't show me, doesn't do me any good. But with God, you can show him 
I mean, you can, you can do things for people. He knows your heart. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Salvation is not based on the work. Salvation is based on the faith. All right. But from a human perspective, you know, we don't care what you say about your faith. What we want to see is the works. Okay. And so I, uh, Elijah wasn't just a man that went around proclaiming the name of God saying, hey, I have faith, I'm a, I'm a prophet, I have... A... No, he followed everything that God said to do. And he, you know, to the best that he could, obviously he's human. But he followed. Uh, in fact, uh, every time you see where it said, the word of the Lord came to Elisha, then he just ends up going and, tell, and doing what God sent him to do. And sometimes, I'm going to show you here in a minute, sometimes the things that he has him do are sort of bizarre, <laughs> you know, but he just by faith goes and he does them. Now, I believe when it comes to uh, salvation, everybody has within them uh, the ability to put their faith in Jesus Christ, okay? It's not like, hey, some God just, it's not like this Calvinist idea where God just granted some people just faith, you know, just randomly chose these people to have faith and other people he didn't. I believe everybody has it within them to receive uh, Christ whenever he's preached to them. <clears throat> the word must be preached. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So it has to be preached, and it has to be believed. But the Christian life, after you're saved, the Christian life is, uh, like I said, uh, is more on the outside about what you do after that. Okay, So the Christian life is about having our faith increased and adding to our faith and having our faith tried, having our faith worked out. Right. Uh, you know, you working out like you're trying to build muscles or something, you literally have to destroy those muscles and have them tried and tested and worked really hard so that they can then grow. You know, and uh, and, and so our faith, if it's going to grow, has to be tried, has to be put to the test. And so Elijah's was given a lot of instructions and some of the instructions were kind of bizarre, but he would actually go and he would do them. Every time the word of the Lord comes to him, uh, he responds. And I'm gonna give you the two examples in this text are verse two, verse two, uh, first Kings 17. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that, it, uh, that is before Jordan. And it shall be, that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. So here's Elijah now, it doesn't actually say that God told him to pray that the rain would stop. It just shows that he, he just asked for it. And God uh, uh, dries it up. But then he says, okay, since there's going to be drought now and you're not going to have the, the you know, food and drink, I want you to go by this brook and continue to drink from the water there. And then I'm going to send these ravens that are going to bring you flesh and bread. Now, God would have to tell you that he's going to do that in order for you to believe that or to be looking for it. Because if birds came and dropped something from their mouth, you know, that would be pretty bizarre, <laughs> you know. And you might eat a little morsel if you're starving and they, they just happen to drop a piece of bread. You might be like, hey, well, I'll just eat that little piece of bread. That's not going to sustain you for very long. So we're looking for lots of ravens to bring lots of <laughs> bread and lots of pieces of meat. Now, this was a bizarre thing. But... Elijah just goes and, uh, and, he, and he stays there until the brook is, is dried. Then look at verse uh, 8. So the brook is dried, and he says, uh, the word of the Lord comes to him again. And it came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So I guess much of living by faith is just waiting for God to provide for your sustenance. <laughs> And so he, arrived, he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called uh, to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. 
And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. So like God doesn't send him to some wealthy person's house or some, you know, doesn't send him to some king that has all the luxuries where he can just go in and be content and live under the king. He sends him to the house of a widow lady. <laughs> And, then, and, and this is the lady that's going to sustain him. Now, that, I, this just popped in my head. I didn't plan on saying this, but I'm going to, I just want to say this. I praise the Lord for the, our older folks in Iola, right, that have been faithful for many, many years. If you saw their conditions, you would say none of these people are wealthy. None of these people, you know, uh, you know, they don't, it's not like they just are, just have money just coming, you know, everywhere. But it is amazing to see how the, their finances have sustained the church all these many years. And since the first day I went as an assistant pastor, they have paid my salary, they paid my rent, they paid my utilities. And, uh, and look, it's humbling. But you know, there are sometimes people are given to you and you're just like, man, I can't take anything from you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't, you know, you need, I, you need somebody to be given to you. But there's people that just live that way, like they're obeying the Lord and they're just giving whatever. And look, don't I don't take that lightly. But here's what I feel like. God has said from day one, as, as he's called me into the ministry, uh, that, he has, that he'll take care of us and he'll provide for us. Now, I feel like I could go out and, and, and get a full-time job and the different, uh, different ways that I could earn some money. I feel like I've got that capability. Uh, but... My time, you know, it needs to be spent as much as possible doing the Lord's work. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I waste a lot of time doing a lot of things that I want to do, like we all do. But I need to be spending time doing the Lord's work. And so he's created a situation. From day one, I've had so many people come to me saying, like, you know, do you, do you have a full-time job or how does the church support you? And I'm like, I don't know how they support me, but they do. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so much so that I was able to start this work. And I don't take any money off of uh, the ties that come out of this work because I don't need it, right? I'm, this my, my income is already set and it's based off of what we were doing, getting in Iola already. And so uh, why do I say that? Because sometimes, you know, you feel like, man, can't we just like, you know, somebody win the lottery or something? <laughs> you know, can't we just like fall into this huge, huge fortune? Does somebody find oil on our property or something like that? And, and we just get all this money, but it's like, Sometimes God allows you, uh, he provides for you in ways that you're just like, I don't understand. This isn't the, this isn't the way I would have asked for this to happen, <laughs> you know? And this is uh, how I find in my life that God often deals with us. And here he sends her to, I mean, it seems rude to me. When I, first time I, re I remember as a kid reading this and thinking, he's just going to this widow lady like, hey, fetch me a piece of morsel, <laughs> you know, bring me some water. And it just, it really does seem kind of rude to me, but he goes and he does this and we don't know the attitude that he had, but he, he is not only putting his faith to the test, but you know, for sure, he's putting that widow lady's faith to the test. And here's what happens. Obviously God ends up blessing the widow as a result of it as well. And, uh, and here's, here's the third point. Here's what I want to make. So Elijah keeps trusting when things are hard to understand. All right. It's one thing for God to say, hey, go, uh, you know, go take this job or something like that. And it's a good paying job. And, you know, all great benefits and all this, you know, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm just stepping out in faith. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's another thing whenever you obey God, and you have like, I have no idea why he asked me to do this. And if you follow the in the Bible, every time God asks a man of God, it seemed like every time uh, he, it's that kind of situation. Like Abraham, Abraham had wealth. And he lived with his parents. He inherited all this stuff. And then they said, you know, I want you to leave your family and your kindred. And I want you to go. Uh, he said, where are we going, Lord? I'll show you. Just keep on wandering until you find it. Right? I'll, I'll take you there. And, uh, and, and so the, all, over and over you see God doing that to people because he's trying their faith. Now, Elijah was a man of faith. And so he should be able to trust the Lord. But then the Lord will ask him to do some very hard uh, things. But the interesting thing is... God speaks to God speaks to people with faith. All right, I've made this point many times. You, you you probably understand what I'm what I'm getting at. But to a person who has no faith in the Lord, 
God is not really interested in like proving himself to that pe to, to those people. What God is looking for is somebody who has faith and then he increases their faith and he reveals himself and that person's faith gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Person that doesn't have any faith, he's not too worried about that. That's that's probably why we see in uh uh you know in the life of Jesus, you were over and over he's speaking very cryptic and in parables and everything so that certain people you know, won't understand it, but then he's speaking a little bit clearer to his disciples. And he's revealing himself certain things to his disciples that he's not revealing to everybody else because they haven't just accepted the simple preaching that, you know, behold the Lamb of God would take away the sins of the world or or follow me. They're not they're not they're not obeying that. And so he's not speaking to them. And I always like to bring up the fact that in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, when, when it talks about Jesus after he rose from the dead and he revealed himself to, it says, many brethren, right? And then he talks about the disciples that he showed himself to. And all those people in there, you see that he revealed himself to believers. Well, you feel like, hey, if I was God, I would just show Jesus and he would, he would rise up from the dead and he would walk around and he would go to all those people that were doubting or didn't put their faith in him and he'd say, see, you killed me, but look at me, I'm alive. See the prince of my... But he didn't do that. He just went back to the disciples and he increased their faith. The people that didn't believe in him, look, God's not impressed. God doesn't care. You know, he wants them to take a step towards him. If we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to, not, nigh to us. And so he's building the faith of Elijah and he's building the faith of the widow as well. But uh, I don't know if I'll bring it out as clearly as I should, but uh, if you compare the faith of Elijah and the faith of the widow woman in the story, uh, her faith isn't anything like his is. But she's still, if you look at it, she's still obeying. She's still doing what she is asked to do. And she's still, uh, uh, you know, but when her, when her son dies, for instance, she's just like, what, what? Well, let me, let, me, let me show you that. Okay, so Elijah uh, kept trusting even when things were hard to understand. <clears throat> the widow woman she can't even feed her family, as we already saw. And then in verse 17, the widow's son dies. Now, this is interesting. I was reading this, and I never really noticed this before. <clears throat> verse 15, she went and did according... Oh, I'm sorry, where am I? Chapter 17, yeah, verse, verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sins to remembrance and to slay my son? Now, I, I used to look at that and say, here's this woman who is saying like, you know, I kind of remember like the children of Israel and they keep going back to Moses and they're like, why did you bring us out of Egypt so that we can die in the wilderness, right? And it really shows their lack of faith. I don't really see that with the widow woman. And I used to think that's what she was doing is like, you know, what, have you just trying to call to my remembrance, my, my sins, and you're trying to slay my son? Here's what I think she's asking. I think she's saying, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? I think what she's saying is, is this why you've come to me? Because she probably has some sin in her life that she's remembering, some sin. And she's saying, is this why my son is dead? Because you're coming to me to remind me of my sin? And like, is this God's punishment upon me? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of conclude with that idea, but I want you to think about that. When something comes in your life, are you just like, why God? Or are you like, why God? <laughs> you know what I mean? Why did you bring that in my life? What am I supposed to be learning from this? What am I supposed to be doing? You know, uh, what would you have me to do? And I feel like that's kind of the case. And I used to read this, like I said, and I thought that she was, she was doubting. And then as I read ahead, I felt like Elijah was doubting because he goes on and he cries to the Lord in verse 20. And he cries unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? It could be that he's just saying, you know, is this your will? Did you mean to bring this evil on her so that, you know, and slay her son? But then he asks for him to, uh, to save the, the child and he does. Uh, so there are a lot of things that can happen that God might ask us to do or God might bring in our life that makes it really difficult to put our faith in Him. But the reason why is because it's not the way we want, it, we want it to be. We want a life of ease. We want pleasure. And so whenever something bad happens, we're tempted to, instead of saying, you know, 
why did God allow that to happen? We're tempted to be like, you know, well, I just don't think I can put my faith in God because he's not coming through for me. Uh, I hope nobody in here is like that, but that's our human nature is to feel that way. And so when God puts things in our life uh, that raises a question like, why is he doing this? Uh, the, we need to be able to continue in uh, our faith. <clears throat> I thought about this as well. Uh, Abraham, look at uh, Hebrews 11. I didn't write down the verse, but I think we can find it. Hebrews 11, uh, looking for Abraham. Thank you. Uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, that would be very strange. Here's a man in his 90s. God had promised that he was going to raise him up a son and he was going to bless his son Isaac and, 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 and the whole world was going to be blessed. And then he has a son. The son grows up to, I don't remember how old he was, but uh, to a fair age, teenager at least. And he uh, is then, you know, told to sacrifice his son. Now we know that the angel stopped him. He didn't end up doing that. But he was really trying Abraham's faith. But Abraham's faith wasn't like, how in the world could God ask me to do that? What a terrible thing. And like trying to run from it or something like that. He just said, I don't know how in the world I could possibly do this. I really don't understand. And he's like, but I'm only thing I can figure is that God's going to raise him up again. And so he's willing to go through with that, what he thinks God has asked him to do. And in our, in our lives, there's going to come a lot of situations where uh, something will happen that we don't understand are you willing to go ahead and follow it, even though you don't understand it? And just know in your heart that God has a reason for asking me to do this. God has a reason for bringing this into my life. God has a reason for putting me through this. I don't understand it. I don't know what is going to come out of it, but I'm going to walk by faith. And at the end of this thing, my faith is going to be grown and something, no doubt, is going to have glorified God and shown his power through this because that's how faith works. And the other thing is when a bad thing happens, like the widow, you know, a bad thing happens. And I don't think I'm reading into it. Uh, I could be, but I, I, I think that's what her attitude was. When a bad thing happens, it's tragic in our life. Do we stop and ask, why did God allow this to happen? Is it something I did? Is it something I need to change in my life? Is this a punishment upon me? I mean, what, what does he want? What do I need to do? You know? At, rather than just getting mad or God, at, mad at God or deciding that's it, I'm just going to give up on God and not follow him anymore. You know, I, I, I can't, I can't, can't, I found another person on uh, Facebook. I've got a lot of Facebook friends of people that I went to Bible college with who, uh, who were, on, I thought, on fire for the Lord, wanting to serve him, wanting to be in the ministry. And now I go back and it's so sad. You know, I find these families, some of their kids are like, uh, you know, like pro LGBT and, and all this. And some of them, uh, most, a lot of these people got divorced and, and uh, not living for the Lord at all, not going to church and all that. And I'm thinking, what in the world? But if you go case by case and you find all those situations, you know, how did they go from being in Bible college, wanting to be missionaries and preachers and, and serve the Lord with their life to like their life basically falling apart and getting completely away from God and all these kinds of things? And it was usually something that happened in their life. And they said, I don't like this. And instead of trusting God, they said, I'm going to take it in my own hands. And they either just left the church or they left serving God or they said they don't believe anymore. Uh, you know, whatever the case. And, they, and it led them to a downward spiral to where now you look at them and you never would have guessed that they were ever even Christians or ever, uh, you know, trying to serve the Lord. But those pivotal times in your life where your faith is tried is what's going to matter the most. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, we did this. 
I, I kind of hate to talk about it because I quit, but <laughs> we did this red eye marathon, right? And the idea is we're training because we're going to do a bigger event and we got to be able to get to that point where we can do that. And so we started at three o'clock in the morning and we uh, were supposed to be out on the trail, but there were thunderstorms. And I said, yeah, hey, I'm all for, you know, you know, toughing it out, but I don't think I want to run into a thunderstorm for seven, seven hours. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we, uh, we went to, a, instead we went to a gym and we ran on treadmills. And, you know, I remember thinking first four miles, we broke it up into four miles and then we wait till the next hour started. And I remember first mile, first four miles went by. That's not too bad. Next mile, uh, four miles went by. Not too bad. But you just start mentally just getting tired. Your legs start hurting. You're just like, man, I'm really thinking about my bed right now. And I quit. OK, <laughs> I quit. But you know what I did think in my head is, you know, actually, this is where the training really begins. When I'm feeling like quitting and I'm thinking about my bed and I'm tired and things are hurting and I'm nauseous or I'm just like mentally like I can't. If you ever tried to run on a treadmill, man, it's, it really stinks <laughs> for long periods of time. When you want to quit is actually where the growth really begins. And so none of us want to be in that point. No, none of us want our patience to be tried and to be tested in such a way. But you've got to remember as a Christian, when my faith is tried, that the point is pivotal in my life to how, my, how much my faith is going to grow and how much God's going to use me in the future. Keep that in mind. Uh, looking forward to continuing the study in uh, the faith of Elijah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this example that we have in Elijah and, uh, and how you've used him and will continue to use him in time to come. Lord, help everybody in here to, uh, to walk in the faith, whether we've been Christians for a long time or we're just newly Christians uh, in the last few years or so. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you'll just increase our faith, help us to sharpen one another uh, as we continue to um, assemble together and exhort one another to provoke one another to good works and all the things you've called us to do as a church. Lord, help us stay in it and, and continue on and endure. And uh, I pray that you be glorified in what you do for the life of everyone in this church and, and for the church as a whole. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.